Father, for some people, this is a discipline that they have never undertaken. To sit for a protracted period of time without the gymnastics of a homiletic one, two, three point sermon, but to go line upon line and verse by verse, to just soak in the sections, the phrases, the verses inspired by your spirit, written by servants throughout the ages, and preserved for our edification. We pray that as we do, we would be edified, you would be glorified, and the word of God would spread. We ask it, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. According to Guinness Book of World Records, the Bible is the best-selling and most widely distributed book in all of the world. Since 1815, according to Guinness, the Bible has sold and different ones have distributed 2.5 billion copies. It has been translated into 2,233 dialects. So it's everywhere, a significant book, and it is this significant book that we study tonight and every time we gather together. If you were to tally up all of the verses in the Bible, you would discover there's 31,173 verses, about 23,000 in the Old Testament and about 8,000 in the New Testament. If you were simply to read those verses from Genesis to Revelation, you could cover the entire Bible, reading at what we call pulpit speed, just reading it out loud, you'd cover it in 71 hours. Now, it's going to take us longer than 71 hours. Uh, we're not going to obviously go longer than the set hour that we have for tonight. We're going to end on time. Trust me on that or relatively close to being on time. <laughs> no, we'll end on time. We have other commitments we have to keep. But it's going to take us way longer than 71 hours. It's going to take us several weeks. And since we want to study and compare, turn, and, and get the text that we read elucidated, it's going to take us quite some time. We're only doing one chapter tonight. Now, we'll speed up our pace in certain portions of the Bible. We'll do two, three, four, five chapters. When we get to lots of genealogies, we'll just kind of notice some of the highlights instead of trying to wrestle through all of the names. We'll speed through those sections more quickly. But the idea is to read it and to feed on it, to study it. I have several Bibles, and I've kept them for years, and the reason I have several is because they get worn out. And so when I teach, I will find one of the Bibles that isn't, doesn't have a page coming out of Genesis, and I'll use that for, because I have a Bible, it's all good, but the book of Ephesians has fallen out. <laughs> and then another Bible where Ephesians is intact, but several of the chapters of Acts have fallen out. And that's okay. It's not that you want to become Bible abusers. You just want to become Bible users. Like Charles Spurgeon used to say, a Bible that is falling apart usually belongs to somebody who isn't. So read it. Use it. And we'll be doing that in these studies and comparing, as I said, Scripture with Scripture. Now we're looking tonight and every time we read the Bible at pure revelation. There's two basic types of revelation. There is general revelation and there is special revelation. Genesis has both. God communicates to mankind generally through the created world around us. But then we read that God spoke and God said. And when God speaks and God said, that's special revelation. Both are highlighted in this book. Both are celebrated, I think perhaps best, in Psalm 19. The psalmist begins by talking about general revelation. The heavens declare the glory of God. The firmament shows his handiwork. 
Day after day, they utter their speech. Night after night, they reveal knowledge. There is no voice. There is no language where their speech is not heard. Their line has gone throughout all of the earth. That's general revelation. God speaks through the created world. But there's something much better, much more secure, much more direct, much more informative, and that is special revelation. And that's the Bible. The same psalm, Psalm 19, as it goes down, says, The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimonies of the Lord are sure, making wise the simple. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold. So as we study through the lens of special revelation tonight, the creation of the heavens and the earth, we'll study general revelation through the lens of special revelation. Just understand that God gives us both, and both are talked about here. Now, in the Bible, we have a sweep from eternity past, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, Genesis 1-1, to eternity future. New heavens, new earth, new Jerusalem, Revelation 21 talks about that. So it gives us the full sweep. But it would help if you understand that there's one main subject, and that's one person. And that is Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the one person that the Bible highlights more than anything else. That is the theme of all of Scripture. One person and two events. Event number one, Jesus' first coming. Event number two, Jesus' second coming. At event number one, Jesus came into the world to take care of sin, to die on the cross to pay for the sins of the world. The second time Jesus comes, he will come to reign over those who have been cleansed of their sin. And that is the theme of all of the scripture. But the Bible is also divided in sections. As you can see, there's an Old Testament and there's a New Testament. But let me suggest five sections with that one theme or that one person or that one subject. And here's five divisions for you. Preparation is number one. That's the whole Old Testament. It's all in preparation, prophetic of, anticipating Jesus' coming. Section number two, manifestation. Those are the four Gospels. The life of Jesus is highlighted, spoken about, discussed, celebrated. Section number three, propagation. That's the book of Acts. The message of Jesus manifested in the Gospels is now taken through Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth by the apostles. Fourth section, information. Those are the epistles of Paul, John, Peter, and others. Uh, They fill in the gaps. They tell the story for the church. And then the fifth division is consummation. And that's the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation. It talks about how God will fulfill his plan throughout all of the ages. And that which was in the beginning will have its end, and God will have a new creation, new heaven, new earth. So those are the five sections. Now we're dealing with the Old Testament, and we will be for some time. In the Old Testament, there are four categories Are you with me so far? Four categories of special revelation. Now, if we were Jewish, I would tell you there are three categories. The law, the prophets, and the writings. And you'll see that distinction even written in the Bible. But we have come in the Western world to divide the Old Testament into four categories of literature. Number one, the law. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. First five books of Moses, or the Pentateuch. Number two, history. Beginning with Joshua, Judges, all the way to the book of Esther is the second division, that is the historical books of the Old Testament. The third category or division is poetry, or you could say wisdom literature. 
from the book of Job all the way through the Song of Solomon, it is written in that Hebrew meter, Hebrew parallelism, and those are the books of poetry or wisdom literature. And the fourth division is prophecy, beginning with Isaiah and ending with the last of the 12 minor prophets, the book of Malachi, and you have the 39 books of the Old Testament with those four categories. We are at the ground level tonight. We are in the foundational book. I suggest you really won't understand anything else in the Bible until you understand Genesis. And I can prove that by simply pointing to this fact. The book of Genesis is quoted 200 plus times in the New Testament, more than any other biblical book. It is foundational. It tells us everything, the origin of the universe, the origin of man, the origin of sin and the fall of man, the origin of marriage, the origin of human government, the origin of the nation of Israel through whom the Messiah would come. It tells us all of those original beginning things. It is foundational, and thus it is quoted much in the rest of the Bible. Now, Genesis covers 2,000 500 years of human history. I'm going to say at least. Maybe more. There is some controversy as to when the beginning was, how long ago that was, but it covers at least 2,500 years of history. Let's say from the fall of man in the early chapters to the death of Joseph. If you were to divide this book up, there's a number of ways you could do it. I'll give you the two easiest ways that I know. You could do what G. Campbell Morgan did, the prince of preachers who preached in London, England, 80, 100 years ago. He divided Genesis up into three main divisions. Number one, generation. Chapters one and two, generation, God creates. Second section, chapters three through 11, degeneration. And then the last Chapters 12 through 50, regeneration. So generation, degeneration, and regeneration. So you have Genesis divided up into three sections. Or you could make it even more simple and say that chapters 1 through 11 cover primeval history. Chapters 12 through 50, patriarchal history. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. Okay, that's enough said on the Bible and an introduction to the book. Let's begin in the beginning. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. In the beginning, you can't go back any further than that. That's as far back as it's possible to go in the beginning. The question is, when was in the beginning? Well, depending on who you ask, you'll get a number of answers. Uh, some, and I would say most evangelicals, would believe in a young earth, no more than 10,000 years old, many of them will say. In fact, some of them will be very dogmatic and say it is 6,000 years old. They say this because they believe that the genealogies in the book of Genesis are closed genealogies. That is, they are a complete genealogy. And as they go through and they extrapolate out the ages and the generations, they've come up with six to 10,000 years old. Now, others would disagree. Others would say the beginning of the universe is two billion, five billion, up to 20 billion years old. Now, I have read a lot on the different uh, ages that are postulated and the disagreements, and, and I notice that both groups are very animated and dogmatic, and they argue back and forth over this issue vehemently. And what comes to my mind is what God said to Job. At the end of the book of Job, God starts speaking after Job and his three friends had talked for a long time. 
And God says, who is this who darkens counsel by words without wisdom? Prepare yourself like a man. I will question you and you will answer me. And here's the question. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. You see the problem. None of the experts in how old the earth is were there. Only God was. So we can speculate and have fun doing it. I I just decided to get out of the speculation business. I don't know when the beginning was, but I know that in the beginning, God. In the beginning, God. And that's how the Bible begins. It doesn't begin with philosophical arguments for the existence of God. It just says, in the beginning, God. It assumes his existence. And he is the only one who can speak with real authority because he was the only one who was there. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Some people can't say in the beginning God. They eliminate God completely. In the beginning, they say, was space and gases. Gases floating in space. But if you try to eliminate God, you have a problem. Where did the space come from? Where did the gas come from? And you can go back and back and back into infinite regression, but you still haven't answered the question. Until you acknowledge there must be some first uncaused cause. In the beginning, God. Now, why is it that people have sought to eliminate God from the beginning or from the universe? Well, Romans chapter 1 tells us. It says they did not wish to retain God in their minds, in their thinking. Because as soon as you acknowledge there is a God who is responsible for all of this, and I live in a personal world made by a personal God, it means I am ultimately morally accountable. So it's more convenient to just say, well, in the beginning, gas is floating in space, and a big bang, an explosion happened, instead of, in the beginning, God. But this is the doorway to the Bible. You can't get to any other part of the Bible unless you go through Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. And it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, if you just believe that, the rest of the Bible is going to be easy for you. Jonah and the whale, piece of cake compared to this. I don't know scientifically how a man could survive. And Okay, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That's a bigger trick. (laughs) If you can get this verse down, Jonah and the whale, the floating axe head of Elijah, Jesus walking on the water, all of it, a piece of cake, a walk in the park, compared to this glorious, majestic first act, the first uncaused cause. God created the heavens and the earth. Back in 1903, a scientist by the name of Herbert Spencer categorized all that is knowable into five categories. That is, he said, and he was the one, by the way, who came up with some of those taxonomic phyla categories for biological life. But he said everything knowable can be placed in one of five categories. Time, force, Action, space, matter. Now, I want to say congratulations, Herbert. That was really good. We applaud you, Herbert. Wonderful that you could add to the scientific knowledge of the world. However, you just articulated, Herbert, Genesis 1-1. In the beginning, that's time. God, that's force. Created, that's action. The heavens, that's space. And the earth, that's matter. And what we start discovering as we go through the book of Genesis is that it's very precise. 
And these scientists come along and go, wow, look what I just discovered. And everybody goes, wow, give you a prize, dude, a Nobel Prize. (laughs) And yet, I submit to you that the man or woman of faith is miles ahead of the man or woman of science. You see, it says in Hebrews chapter 4, or Hebrews chapter 11, by faith, we believe that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. Did you hear that? He just made a statement of faith. By faith, we believe that everything in the material world is made up of materials you can't see. We call those atomic and subatomic particles. Now, somebody came along and discovered that all matter is broken up into these invisible particles, and that's what everything's made out of. And they come along and they say, we just made a discovery. And we go, we've always known that. The Bible tells us plainly that everything we can see wasn't made up of visible but invisible particles. So the person of faith will be further ahead than even the person of great science. Now, if you can combine science and faith, and I believe you can quite well, you can be pretty far ahead of the game. In the beginning, God created. I know that we've just barely covered one verse, and we'll, we'll speed it up as we go, but this is pretty foundational. <laughs> Something else. One of the things we discover, and I'm milking it for this reason, God doesn't tell us a lot about his creative process. He doesn't give us much information. If you were to count... There's only 630 words God uses to describe the origin of everything. This is an abridged version of creation. He spent far more time and space talking about Abraham, far more time and space talking about the tabernacle, just a few words speaking about creation. But the purpose of Genesis isn't a biology lesson. How many in in Moses' day or Abraham's time would have understood it if it were? God and the author through the Holy Spirit has an agenda to show us briefly the origin of all things and then to take us quickly to the origin of the Hebrew nation through which genealogy would come, the Savior of the world, the Messiah. So the book has a definite agenda as it takes us through. So, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Okay. This is where you lose most people. The modern mind today believes that evolution is such a done deal and such a closed case, it can't even be argued. And if it is argued, it's by idiotic fundamentals who happen to stupidly believe in the literal inspiration of the Bible. And I'm one of them. But they think it's such a done deal. Everybody knows. Try it. Talk about this publicly with someone. Everybody knows, they will say, that evolution is a fact. It's a known fact. It's a done deal. It's a closed case. Not so fast. Some of the most brilliant minds in the scientific community would say, not so fast. It is not a closed case. It is not a done deal. It is still a theory, and it is still speculative. For example, molecular biologist Michael Denton said, and I quote, the evolutionary theory is still, as it was in Darwin's time, a highly speculative hypothesis entirely without direct factual support. Close quote. Now, if you studied the origin of the species by Darwin and some of his other writings, you know that one of the glaring problems Charles Darwin saw with the evolutionary theory was the fossil record. He knew that there were huge gaps, inexplicable by him, in the fossil record. That paleontology did not agree with his theory, but he also believed and stated that time would vindicate him. 
that the more we study the fossil record, the more we will know that evolution is a fact. Well, been 120 plus years since Darwin's time. David Raup, curator of the Field Museum of Natural History in Chicago, writes, and I quote, we are now over 120 years after Darwin, and the knowledge of the fossil record has been greatly expanded. We now have a quarter of a million fossil species, but the situation hasn't changed much. We have fewer examples of evolutionary transition than we had in Darwin's time. Now, I'm going to tell you a story. Billions of years ago, and this thing took a long time, billions of years ago, there were gases and explosions and fluids and other explosions and great upheavals and cataclysms, and eventually, a tiny particle of rubber was formed. It took a long time, and it took a lot of processes but a little tiny particle of rubber was formed, and then over thousands and even millions of more years, a tread formed on the rubber. <laughs> it became more complex. And four of these things formed sequentially, and then other explosions and gases and metal formed. And anyway, over billions of years, a car formed and came up out of the earth. <laughs> now, you're laughing, and that is the right response. It's stupid. It's silly. You look at a car, you look at a beautiful automobile, it, 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 it belies uh, design. It's been designed, and if it's been designed, there has to be a, a designer. It's the teleological argument for creation. Anything designed must have a designer. So if that's true of a car or a watch, what about a brain? A complex human being just happened, a fortuitous occurrence of accidental circumstance, randomness over billions of years, that's not smart. That defies logic. It defies good science. Now, I will also admit something to you because I studied the sciences. I discovered in my classes, in my courses, in my work before I got into the ministry, that most intelligent people do believe in evolution. And that stunned me. It was an eye-opener. But then I discovered why. I, I, I truly believe this. Most intelligent people believe in evolution because they believe most intelligent people believe in evolution. They don't want to be an outcast. They don't want to be considered controversial or stupid. Easier to fit in instead of go against the system that many scientists dare to do. If you believe in evolution, I will congratulate you right here and right now. You have way more faith than I have. You're a great man or woman of faith. For you to say that over billions of years, just randomness is responsible for a highly complex carbon life in this biosphere takes more faith than to believe in the beginning, God, the first uncaused cause, created force, the heavens and the earth. And that's how the Bible begins. And that's what the Bible appeals to. And can I just say this too? So, so maybe we won't make it through Genesis 1, but, but, but <laughs> let, let me just say this too. Do, do you realize, do you realize what you will be able to live through in life with great confidence if you believe this? Can, can you fathom the kind of stability you can have if you believe this? You know, in Acts chapter 4, when they were arrested in Jerusalem, and the, the heat was on, do you remember how they prayed? Lord, you are God. You created the heavens, the earth, the sea, and everything that is in them. That's how they begin their prayer. Now, they're going to pray for a pretty hefty thing, 
but they couldn't have prayed for that pretty hefty thing unless they made that beginning statement. You created the heavens, the earth, the sea. And if you did that, then that is, is my basis of my prayer. If you did that, then you can certainly answer this. Here's my issue. And before I bring to you my issue, my problem, I'm recognizing who you are. And if you believe that that's who God is, you're going to find faith comes quite easily. You have a relationship with the one who made the heavens and the earth? Sky is the limit. Okay, verse 2. <laughs> the earth was without form and void. Two Hebrew words, tohu vabohu. Tohu means ruined or empty. Bohu means vacant. The earth was ruined, empty, vacant. And darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. It was without form and void. It was unfinished in shape. It was uninhabitable by creatures. That was in the beginning. Now, some people see a gap between Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-2. They see an initial creation in verse 1, and then a subsequent recreation in verse 2. And that is because the word in verse 2, the earth was, you see the word was? It's the Hebrew word hayata, which can be and often is translated became. And the earth became without form and void. It wasn't made that way in the beginning, but it became that way. Now follow me here. They will then point to Isaiah 45, and I'm going to read a section of Scripture to you, Isaiah 45, verse 18. For thus says the Lord, who created the heavens, who is God, who formed the earth and made it, who established it, who did not create it in vain. He did not create it, tohu is the, is the Hebrew word. He did not create it in vain. Who formed it to be inhabited, I am the Lord, and there is no other. So, many will point to some cataclysmic pre-Adamic catastrophe between verse 1 and verse 2. And this is where they will fit the fall of Satan, the fall of Lucifer. Lucifer, son of the morning, light bearer, who fell with a third of the angels and was cast to the earth. And some will even say there was a whole human race headquartered in the Garden of Eden over which Lucifer uh, was overseeing, and then uh, he fell. And, and there's all sorts of stories. Now, it is possible that Satan did fall between verses 1 and 2, and that the earth became without form and void. There was a subsequent judgment before a recreation. But I just got to say, I don't know. I wasn't there. A again, the question of Job, where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? I have to say, I wasn't there. So it is a possibility. It is a theory. It's called the gap theory. I'm not sure. So let's keep going and look at the six days of creation, beginning in verse 3. Then God said, let there be light. And there was light. It's even more emphatic in the original. God said, light be. You know, God didn't go, now how am I going to do this? What, what is the recipe again for light? How, how do I work this out? Just, he spoke. The very first words of God recorded in Scripture are here. Let there be light. And light happened. Light was. And God saw the light, that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day and the darkness he called night, and evening and morning were the first day. Now notice the phrase, let there be. If you were to count them up, I've counted them for you, they appear ten times in this chapter. We call these the ten commandments of creation. Let there be, let there be, let there be, let there be. God said that ten times, and he framed it by his word, and it happened. God said, let there be light, and there was light. Notice in verse 5, God called the light day. Day. 
Okay, can I just give you a little bit of pre-information for the rest of the Bible? You're going to find three usages of the word day in the Bible. The Hebrew word is yom. You've heard of yom kippur, the day of atonement. Yom is day. Three ways it's, it's used in the Bible. One is the portion of the 24-hour period where there is light. That is called the day. That's number one. Number two, the Bible uses the term day for a period of time that is several days or weeks or months or years. The term the day of the Lord is such a usage. It covers a whole bunch of events that don't happen in a 12-hour or 24-hour period. But years, the day of the Lord or the day of Christ is another. But then the third usage is, I believe, this usage, a 24-hour period. And whenever you find a numerical adjective, like first day, second day, third day, fourth day, fifth day, like you do in Genesis, it refers to a 24-hour period. Thus, I do not believe in theistic evolution. You could see where I was going with that. I don't believe that it took God millions of years and billions of years, and he called that period a day, and then more stuff took place, and he called that a day. God did it in six 24-hour periods, and I think that was a long time. I mean, God could have done it in six seconds. He took a whole day to do that, so he took his time. So I believe in these six days, 24-hour periods, because it says, and evening and morning were the first day, and evening and morning were the second day. Now, in hearing that, you might think, didn't the author get that backwards? Shouldn't it be, and morning and evening were the first day, instead of, and evening and morning were the first day? Well, apparently not. In fact, the Hebrews, because of this verse, reckon the beginning of their day at twilight. Sun goes down, they see the first three stars, that's the beginning of the day, and it goes all the way through to the next evening when it's twilight again. So if you're in Israel and you want to celebrate Shabbat, Sabbath, which is Saturday, it begins Friday evening. You better get home quickly. And evening and morning were the first day. Brings up a question. God said, let there be light. Yet, we don't find the sun, moon, and stars created until the fourth day. So how could there be light in our universe without everything that we know as the source or the reflection of light to be present? That's a good question. I can only answer it by saying, I don't know. <laughs> but I can speculate. And I do want to say I'm giving my opinion now. There's a couple of things here. The Bible says God dwells in unapproachable light. There was in the Old Testament this thing called the Shekinah glory of God, this visible, light-filled presence of God that appeared in the tabernacle, later in the temple for a period of time. It was this manifestation of God, and it was in light. It could have been that before God created the sun, moon, stars, and day four, that day one, it was simply his Shekinah glory. If you've studied the electromagnetic spectrum, you know that Radiation that travels at 186,000 miles per second, photon energy, goes all the way from radio waves um, uh, up through um, infrared, then visible light, and then ultraviolet, Rankinographic rays, um, uh, gamma rays, cosmic rays. But even in that visible light, there's, there's a range of, of uh, size and, and, and length of, of waves. So that even without the sun, even without the moon, there certainly could have been just God emanating. Here's another explanation. That on day one, God created the sun, stars, moon, etc. But they didn't become visible because of the canopy, the shroud around the earth until day four. That's what many speculate. But I'll just say, I don't know. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. So evening and morning were the first day. Now here's day two. Then God said, let there be a firmament 
or a vault or a dome is be the Hebrew translation of the word rakiah. Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters and let it divide the waters from the waters. Thus God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament and the waters which were above the firmament. And God called the firmament heaven. And so evening and morning were the second day. Now, it's believed that there was, at this time, a canopy, a water canopy, a vapor canopy, like a dense fog above the atmosphere, uh, in the ionosphere, that, that did a number of things. It, it encircled the earth. It created sort of a greenhouse or hothouse effect. You'd have temperate, mild, warm climate worldwide. You'd have no barren deserts. You'd have uh, no polar ice caps, that there was this uniform temperature created by this hothouse effect because of the vapor canopy that watered the earth. By the way, there's a lot of water up there, even without the canopy. Uh, Kauai, there's a rainforest in Kauai that boasts of 200 inches of rain per year. There's a lot of water up there. Well, at one time, it is believed that this canopy of, of vapor of water that watered the whole earth it would keep mass air movements from being created, winds, hurricanes, etc. It would filter out the ultraviolet radiation, that very short wavelength radiation that either causes or helps in um, shortening the lifespan of man, so that would account for the longevity of people upon the earth. And so that there was... The earth, this unformed mass, God created light. Then God separated the vapor canopy above the atmosphere, creating this greenhouse effect so that carbon-based life could flourish upon the earth. And he called the firmament heaven. Okay, there's another word. Be, beware that in the Bible, the word heaven is used three different ways, just like day. Sometimes the Bible speaks of the heavens as the atmosphere, that firmament of space above the earth. Jesus spoke about the birds of the heaven. Sometimes the Bible speaks of the heavens being outer space. The heavens declare the glory of God, Psalm 19, David said. Space was James T. Kirk's final frontier. <laughs> Remember that? Space, the final frontier. Well, not really. That's only the second heaven. The Bible speaks about, yes, the terrestrial heaven, the atmosphere, the celestial heaven, the space, uh, outer space. But there's, there's a third heaven the Bible speaks about, the third heaven. 2 Corinthians 12, Paul said, I was taken into the third heaven. Now, that's the heaven of heavens. That's God's heaven. That's the place where God's glory dwells in its fullness. But this is the heaven of the atmosphere. And above that firmament, was thought to be this canopy. Now the third day, verse 9, God said, Let the waters under the heaven be gathered together into one place, and let the dry land appear, and it was so. God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters he called seas, and God saw that it was good. So there must have been some cataclysmic upheaval, shifting of the surface of the earth and the tectonic plates and the water was plunged downward and gathered into what we call seas. By the way, the term seas is a general term for all bodies of water, lakes, rivers, bays, oceans, not just oceans, but it includes all of that. God saw that it was good. And boy, it is good. Because water is so essential to our life. Three quarters of this planet is covered in water. 65% of your flesh is made out of water. 90% of your blood is made out of water. It is essential to digestion, reproduction, respiration, everything we do. We need water in the air, etc., etc. That's why when I read Revelation 21, I am so disheartened when it says, and I saw a new heaven and a new earth, 
and there was no more sea. And I'm thinking, that, that's heaven? You know, if I was writing the book, this is how I'd want to describe heaven. And there will be no more cities, but lots of sea and lots of beach. But apparently it indicates that it's not going to be a water-based planet. The new heaven, the new earth that will be created after this one is destroyed because we're going to have resurrected bodies and not depend on the same elements that we have, that there's not going to be any need for it. And, and before you get too bummed out, realize that the oceans have been part of the separation that keeps one people group from another people group. There'll be no more separations, no sea. Instant access. But that's for the book of Revelation. And judging from how we're going, <laughs> it's going to take a while to get there. God saw that it was good. And God said, verse 11, let the earth bring forth grass, and the herb that yields seed according to its kind, whose seed is in itself on the earth, and it was so. And the earth brought forth grass, the herb that yields seed according to its kind, and the tree that yields fruit, whose seed is in itself according to its kind, and God saw that it was good. God already established the reproduction in the plant world. Seeds, obviously when they were made then, there was a certain age that was built into that creation because they had seeds in them, able to then reproduce and have other plants like it according to its kind. Now, something you will notice in the creation, though it's done just in a few words, very briefly, there never is a movement vertically, though there is certainly movement horizontally. That is, it defies the evolutionary theory which believes in the principle of transmutation, that over a period of time the species changed and tails fell off and limbs grew, etc. The only problem is there's no real evidence, as I said, in the fossil record to show that. If that were true, there wouldn't just be evidence, there'd be an abundance of transmutative forms in our world, and there's not in the strata. There's plenty of room for horizontal movement and horizontal latitude. Um, uh, uh, micro movements, not macro movements. Back in 1934, they were able to cross a loganberry and a raspberry and a blackberry and, and come up with a raspberry. I mean, a boysenberry. So they took those three berries and they were able to make this hybrid cross of a boysenberry. So it's still a berry. They didn't take three berries and make an orange. <laughs> they were able to move laterally in small increments, not macro, but micro increments, not transmutation, but crossing and mutation. And there is a big difference between mutative forms and transmutative forms, which there's a glaring lack of. So it's according to its kind, according to its kind, according to its kind. And though there can be micro movements, there's certainly no vertical movements. God saw that it was good, so evening and morning were the third day. Verse 14, and God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and seasons for days and years. And you know what? We still use them. The original calendar was the lunar calendar based on the movement of the moon. Our calendar is the solar calendar based upon the relationship of the earth to the sun for signs. Let them be for lights in the firmament of the heavens to give light on the earth. And it was so. And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day, the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. And he set them in the firmament of the heavens to give light on the earth and to rule over the day and over the night and to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good, so evening and morning were the fourth day. The Milky Way galaxy is this strangely shaped cluster of luminaries that sort of resembles a, 
a, a wide, very thin watch. The Milky Way galaxy in measurement is 10,000 light years by 100,000 light years. And where the Earth is situated, scientists have discovered it's just situated perfectly for the kind of life that we now have. Now, people will say, well, it just so happened. Okay, it just so happened that the Earth is 93 million miles away from its sun that has a surface temperature of 12,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Just so happened. If we were as close as Venus, the surface temperature on Venus is 850 degrees Fahrenheit, we'd burn up. We couldn't last. If we were as far away as Mars, the temperature dips to minus 200 degrees Fahrenheit on Mars. But it just so happens that we're 93 million miles away from a surface that's 12,000 degrees. It just so happened. And, by the way, it just so happened that the Earth makes 365 revolutions as it makes its journey around the sun. Why not 30? Well, the days would be 10 times longer. There would be alternate burning and freezing and carbon-based life. This kind of life we enjoy in this biosphere would not be sustained. And it just so happened that that revolving sphere is tilted 23 and a third degrees on its axis in relationship to the sun to give us four beautiful seasons. Oh, something else. It just so happens that the makeup of the atmosphere is a percentage of oxygen to nitrogen, 79% to 20%, with 1% of variant gases. That makes breathing just a pleasure. <laughs> what if it weren't 79 to 20? What if it were 50 to 50? 50% 50 oxygen, 50% nitrogen. Well, the first guy to light up a cigarette. <laughs> Talk about the Big Bang Theory. It'd be all over in a flash. And it just so happens that this water-laden earth, if the oceans, they tell us, were half of the present dimensions that they are now, there would only be, or there would be less than a fourth of the rainfall that we have on the earth. Life couldn't be sustained. If they were just a bit bigger, like an eighth bigger, the earth would be a flood. All of the things are just right. And it just so happened. It's, it's, a, it's a wonderful accident. No back to the car oozing out of the ground. It's a marvelous design by a creator. And by the way, this galaxy, it speaks about the galaxy and the stars and the moon and the sun, but the, the center of it is Earth. That's right. We are the center of the universe as far as life is concerned. It's a pretty big universe. I said it's 10,000 by 100,000 light years. If you could hop on a ray of light and go 186,000 miles per second, you could go around the Earth. At that speed, you could do it in seven and a half times in one second. If you're doing that speed and you shoot out to the moon, in 1.5 seconds, you'll sail past the moon, going the speed of light. In... Two minutes and 18 seconds, you'll sail past Venus. In four minutes, you'll sail past Mercury. In seven and a half minutes, you'll get past the sun. In four hours, you'll go to Pluto. But in four years and four months, you'll make it from Earth to the nearest neighbor star, Alpha Centauri. Alpha Centauri is 4.3 light years away from the Earth. But... If you're traveling 186,000 miles per second, it'll take you 100,000 years to get from one end of your Milky Way galaxy to the other end of it. 100,000 years at 186,000 miles per second. And if you do that, you haven't even left the front yard because they tell us there are 100 billion more galaxies beyond. But God's interested in the earth. And all of these serve his created life upon the earth. 
Now, how does that make you feel? I hope you, instead of going, well, I don't know about life, man, it's such a bummer. And I'm like, oh. I'll be careful. And I'll be quick. God said, let the waters abound with an abundance of living creatures. Let birds fly above the earth across the face of the firmament of the heavens. And God created great sea creatures and every living thing that moves with which the waters abounded according to their kind, every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good and God blessed them. Isn't that great? God blessed the birds and blessed the whales and the squids and the sharks and said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters and the seas. Let the birds be multiplied on the earth. So evening and morning were the fifth day. And God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures according to its kind. Cattle, these are domestic animals is the better term, and creeping things. And the beast, these are non-domestic animals, wild animals. Each according to its kind, and it was so. And God made the beast of the earth according to its kind, cattle according to its kind, and everything that creeps. So all the creeps were made on the sixth day as well. <laughs> according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. I'm just going to plant something in your brain because I'm out of time. It would appear then, according to the Bible, that dinosaurs which did exist, there's plenty of evidence, and man were created on the same day and thus lived at the same time. Now, I'm planning that in your mind because you have seen signs in natural history museums that are before a dinosaur skeleton and say that dinosaurs reigned uh, for 140 million years, but quickly died 60 million years before the advent of man on the earth. Well, the Bible disagrees with that, and I believe science disagrees with that, and I'll show you why next time. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. And so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, See, I have given you every herb that yields seed which is on the face of the earth, and every tree whose fruit yields seed, to you it shall be for food. Also to every beast of the earth, to every bird of the air, to everything that creeps on the earth in which there is life, I have given every green herb for food, and it was so. And God said, God saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good, so evening and morning were the sixth day. So I wanted to say I did Genesis 1 tonight. <laughs> now let's pray. And we'll, uh, we'll pick up on some of the finer details and chapter 2 and maybe 3 next week. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your revelation. We thank you for how you have revealed yourself in the world, the natural world. We look around, and as Paul said in Romans, we would be without excuse not to believe in a designer behind the design thinker behind the thought. And we discover that we don't live in an impersonal world, but a personal world made by a personal God who wanted to make creatures in his image according to his likeness. Lord, thank you that in this vast place called this universe, the heavens and the earth, we can know the creator and if the art hanging in the sky is as glorious as it is, the artist himself must be amazing. And so it all leads us back to worship of you in Jesus' name. Amen.